at the end last time, I left myself the task of proving a theorem that you can achieve transversality for symplectic, uh, for holomorphic curves and symplectic cobordisms for generic J. Uh, let me repeat the statement quickly. So the setting is the completion of a symplectic cobordism, which has stable Hamiltonian structures at the positive and negative ends. And I've fixed some open subset, which I said is pre-compact, so it's an open and bounded subset. And let me introduce some new notation slightly better than what I did last time. Let's say J fix is just some choice of almost complex structures, uh, some choice of almost complex structure in this special class I defined, compatible with the symplectic form and with the stable Hamiltonian structures. And now the statement of theorem two says that there exists, I guess I'll say the word co-meager since everyone else is, a co-meager subset uh, J U reg sitting in the space of all almost complex structures compatible with the data which also match our choice J fix outside of this subset U such that all, well let's say for all J in this special class, all holomorphic curves in the moduli space defined by J with injective points in the subset U are regular. Okay, so somebody asked a question last time whether, uh, whether I really need to say that the curve is not a multiple cover or somewhere injective or just that there exists an injective point in the perturbation domain U. Uh, the answer is all those things are equivalent in this situation, but I'm stating it this way because in the proof that's precisely what we need. We need the existence of an injective point that gets mapped into the perturbation domain. So in other situations where those conditions are not all equivalent, still this is what you need. All right, so I've got a few choices of the technicalities when I go about something like this. I first need to decide uh, in what space exactly of almost complex structures do I want to consider perturbations. And well, there's a natural space in the picture, which is the wrong one, because what I'm really interested in, of course, is this space of almost complex structures that I assume are all smooth with the C infinity topology on it. And you can call that a Frechet manifold at least, because you, you, oh, I'm saying M when I mean W hat, apologies. So W hat, of course, is not compact. And it's not so easy to define uh, either Banach norms or even semi norms on a non-compact domain, but of course, I'm only allowing these perturbations to be non-trivial outside of this compact subset, or inside this compact subset. So it's easy enough to define semi-norms, and I can call this object here a Frechet manifold, but Frechet manifolds are not very useful to me, because the implicit function theorem doesn't hold, the sard smale theorem doesn't hold. There's a whole uh, lot of analytical results I need, which I can't use. So really, I need some Banach manifold. What do you mean by with injective points in U precisely? Sorry? What do you mean by with injective points in U? So injective point is, right, you, you understand that part, or, <laughs> right. So I mean an injective point whose image is contained in the subset U. So those exist. That's the assumption. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying all curves have that property. I'm saying I'm only considering curves that have that property. Okay. So when you apply this theorem, of course, uh, it's going to miss some curves, right? The, the typical way you'd apply it is you'd let U be the compact part of the cobordism, not including the cylindrical ends. And then it doesn't say anything about curves that are contained entirely in the cylindrical ends. 
but we'll have another theorem for that in a little bit. So, so I have to make a choice of some Banach manifold of almost complex structures. And Duza explained one possible choice yesterday, which is instead of looking at uh, smooth almost complex structures, ask them to be of class C k for some finite k. Um, that's a good choice, but I'm a little bit allergic to it myself, just because if I then write down the nonlinear Cauchy Riemann operator for a j which is not smooth, then the operator on the, so the section of the Banach space bundle will also not be smooth. It will have finitely many derivatives. The Sard snail theorem requires my maps to have at least some number of derivatives. I'd have to look it up to find out how many. And these are details I don't really want to worry about if I have a choice. I'd rather have everything in the picture be smooth, except for, of course, the maps themselves are going to be of Sobolev class. But I'd like J to be smooth so that my nonlinear Fredholm section is smooth. So I'm going to adopt Fleur's solution to that problem, which is to define the following object. So proof. Let's uh, fix another almost complex structure that I will call the reference J, J ref. That's in this space as well. And matching J fix. outside of you. And I'm just going to consider for the moment almost complex structures that are perturbations of J ref in some precise sense. So the other piece of data I need to fix is a set of positive numbers, which I'll denote collectively by epsilon. It's a sequence and the sequence is converging to zero. And then define J epsilon to be the space of all J's of the form exp along J ref of some Y. So I'm taking exp, imagine exp to be the exponential map on the manifold of complex structures on each tangent space. That's something you can define however you like. It is a manifold, so that's fine. Uh, y, I can consider to be in the tangent space to that Frechet manifold uh, and also vanishing outside of you. Uh, so literally this just means it's, it's a smooth section of the bundle whose fibers are the tangent spaces to the manifolds of complex structures on the tangent spaces. Uh, and I'm saying a smooth section, but I'm also going to require that it's finite in this so-called Fleur C epsilon norm that's defined as the sum from zero to infinity of epsilon m times the C m norm. So I want that to be fine. In fact, I'm going to require that it's small for some constant c. Okay. So there's an exercise one needs to do, and it's a standard lemma that you can find in various places, originally in, in some of Fleur's original papers, that if you choose this sequence of epsilons, converging to zero fast enough, then this norm not only defines a Banach space, but it defines one which is large enough to contain smooth bump functions supported in arbitrarily small uh, neighborhoods of points. That's the key thing we need to know about this. So that defines a Banach space of Ys, and just exponentiating that from J ref, we get a Banach manifold of Js. It's trivially a Banach manifold. I've just defined one chart on this Banach manifold. So it's a small one. And this is, in some sense, not any kind of global construction. I, I cannot get anywhere near a dense set of Js with this. But I can get Js at least arbitrarily close to J ref. And J ref, to start with, was, was arbitrary. Okay. 
So now, the universal moduli space, m star of j epsilon, is going to be the set of pairs u and j, where j belongs to the j epsilon space, and u is a holomorphic curve for j. And also, I want it to satisfy the extra conditions that u is somewhere injective, or namely u has an injective point mapped to the perturbation domain u. Okay? So that's traditionally called universal moduli space. I think given the way we're doing it, it's not a terribly good name because it is not universal in the sense of being able to consider all possible j's that we might be interested in. We're only looking at j's that are in some neighborhood of j ref, and in fact, it's, it's not just a smooth neighborhood, it's a neighborhood of j ref in a very peculiar topology on the space of smooth functions. Okay? At the end of the day, I'm just going to care about the fact that I can get arbitrarily c infinity close to j ref by objects in this space. Why is roughly a Complex structure, right? tangent space to complex structures. What's a tangent space to complex structures? So literally, it's uh, it's a section of the endomorphism bundle which anti-commutes with J. Okay. And how do you test the difference? What does it mean? Um, big. What does it mean? Normal. The CM norm. Well, pick pick a Riemannian metric and measure it. Integrate uh, it. Yeah. No, not integrate. Just uh, the soup norm. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, important detail there is, of course, the thing is only non-trivial in this compact subset. Oh, true. Makes three sense. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? So it, this is a different topology in the space of functions for all epsilon. Uh... Presumably, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And how am I supposed to think about this topology? Am I not supposed to think about this topology? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, I, I also would not say that I really know how to think about this topology. The main things we need to know are, again, uh, the space is large enough to contain bump functions of small support. Uh, that's a, that's a non-obvious lemma, that, but it has a pretty quick proof due to Fleur. Uh, otherwise, you just need to know that this space includes continuously into C infinity with the ordinary C infinity topology. Yeah, just to make sure I understand. So if I work so thinking about only considering C infinity J's, and I could just work with CKJs in the usual. You can follow. Yeah. 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 Working with CKJs is also a perfectly fine way to do this. Yes? Uh, I have just a question uh, about the notation. So, like, at the, uh, about the epsilon, it means that you have, like, uh, the limit of epsilons, like, with K going to infinity is zero. Or yes. Okay. Yes. Um, do we also need to bound the j's we include in j epsilon to ensure omega compatibility, or is that taken care of by? Ah, yeah. So omega compatibility is is it's implicit here when I said that y belongs to the tangent space of this space. Okay. So yeah, that is a that's a, a linear algebraic condition on y point wise. Yes. Why did we have to choose it with JRF? Uh, I mean, we had three things. Right. The reason I didn't just use JFix here is that if I did, what I will have proved in the end is that a small perturbation of JFix achieves transversality. I would like to actually know that given any J in my admissible set, I can perturb that one to achieve transversality. So J ref is arbitrary, except for the conditions I stated. OK. So hopefully we're all on the same page. Now, we have this functional analytics setup that we introduced last time. We know how to understand the moduli space of holomorphic curves locally as the zero set of a cauchy riemann operator, possibly divided by some symmetry action. Let's just write that down in this case. Uh, so. The result comparable to what I ended with last time is we can say a neighborhood of 
the element, let's say u naught is the J holomorphic curve with complex structure J naught, and the target almost complex structure is called capital J naught. So that defines an element of the universal moduli space. And a neighborhood of that element is now going to be in bijective correspondence with a neighborhood of the equivalence class uh, sorry, yes, neighborhood of little j naught u naught capital J naught in some zero set of a section divided by the automorphisms of u naught, where this section I'm talking about maps. So again, I have my Teichmuller slice. It's a finite dimensional space a uh, manifold of complex structures on the domain parametrizing a neighborhood in Teichmuller space. B is my Banach manifold of maps of some Sobolev class from sigma dot into W hat. And then I have J epsilon. That's the one element that I, I didn't have in this picture before, mapping to some Banach space bundle. You can infer from this picture what the fibers of this Banach space bundle are supposed to be. I'm just going to write down the map, of course, since little j u big j to t u plus big j of t u uh, little j. Okay. So that again is a smooth section of some Banach space bundle. It is smooth because all the capital J's are smooth. If the capital J's were not smooth, then I would have a bit more of a headache to figure out exactly how differentiable this section is. That's why I introduced the C epsilon space. Yeah. On the right hand side, where are the parentheses? The parentheses. As in, what do you divide by R? You divide the neighborhood by R, or you divide by R and then the neighborhood? I divide the zero set of this section by R. Right? So this is a, it's some diffeomorphisms of the domain which act on all three of these well, it doesn't do anything to big J, but it acts on these two. The same way that we had yesterday. So, I mean, I can actually, I can eliminate that from the picture here because actually, U naught is somewhere injective. So I can get rid of the automorphism group, it's trivial. So I'm in the world of manifolds at this point, if I'm talking about simple codes, yeah. So the neighborhood on the right-hand side includes a little variation in the j, little j naught, right? Yes. So does that mean that M star includes varying the complex structure? Sure, absolutely. I mean, right, M star is, it's, so this is just shorthand notation. It's not just a map U, it's an element of this moduli space, which includes the data of the domain. So the domain complex structure is absolutely allowed to vary throughout this picture. OK. So there's my section. Uh, and of course, I would like to know whether the universal moduli space is smooth. It's going to be a smooth Banach manifold if the linearization of that section is always surjective. And that's the main thing one has to prove in any argument of this sort. And we already heard a little bit from, from Dusa about this yesterday uh, on why you have to prove it and why it goes wrong sometimes, specifically if you don't have the existence of an injective point. So let's talk about that. Let's write down the linearization first. It's going to take a triple Y eta capital Y to, well, differentiating that thing with respect to Lowercase j gives us j of t u of y. Differentiating with respect to u gives us the usual Cauchy Riemann, uh, linearized Cauchy Riemann operator associated to u, which I'm just going to uh, denote by du of eta. And then we additionally have differentiation with respect to capital J gives y of t u of j. So note the first two terms in this expression together 
are precisely the operator that I wanted to be surjective when I talked about regularity yesterday. So uh, these two form a surjective operator if and only if u is Fredholm regular. That was the definition, which I, I didn't really write down, but I implied it. And I have this additional term, the advantage of which is that y is now varying in an infinite dimensional vector space. So it makes it a lot more plausible that you could force this operator to be always surjective. So how do we see if it is? That's the claim. This thing is surjective. And uh, let me be a little bit more specific about my functional analytics setting at this point. So last time, uh, I said that the maps u are in some Bonnick manifold of maps that are of class WKP. And I didn't specify k and p except to say that k times p is greater than 2. So that Sobolev embedding tells you this is contained in C0. Uh, for convenience right now, just to make my life easier, I'm going to assume k equals 1. So let's say uh, this, this operator is really going to take the tangent space to, uh, to Teichmuller slice plus some class, some, some space of w1p class sections of u star tw plus the tangent space to big J. I'm going to take those two sections of class LP. I need the exponential weights, as Helmut would point out to me if I don't say it myself. Okay. Uh, the subject of why I need the exponential weights should be discussed, but I don't have time for it in this talk, so I, I would be happy to do that in the discussion. Section. Yes. What is an exponential rate? So remember th the definition of this space, right? We had this con this asymptotic condition on the behavior of, of sections that said it's not just that they are of class W K P on the cylinder, but e to the delta s times the section is of class W K P. So it forces exponential decay. Uh, the delta itself is just some small positive number. That's we said as long as it's small enough you're not losing any holomorphic curves by imposing this condition. So I, I'm very fond of the philosophy, by the way, that nothing you do in this whole story should ever really depend on your choice of Sobolev space, as long as you satisfy the condition for uh, inclusion to C0 or even some larger differentiability if you want. Uh, so I don't like making this choice, but it's only the first step in the proof. If you want to then prove that the same thing is true for WKP to WK minus 1P, uh, that becomes easy if you have already, you can prove it inductively, basically. So I'm just going to do this case. Now, so if it's not surjective, then we can say, there exists some element of the dual of LP delta here that annihilates the whole image. Right. So the image is killed by some non-zero element I'll call theta in the dual of LPW. Quick digression. I don't really like this distinction people like to make between analysts and topologists <laughs> and whatever else people want to call themselves, uh, partly because I don't personally feel like I am either an analyst or a topologist. Uh, I have no idea what I am. But uh, enough people think of me as an analyst, I guess, that they, they often ask me the following question. Why do you need to worry about Sobolev spaces in particular, in this whole picture, right? Uh, why can't you just say, let's consider maps of class CK? Isn't that, doesn't that give you a reasonable Banach manifold? Uh, it does give you a reasonable Banach manifold. Of course, reason number one why we might prefer the Sobolev spaces is that we have certain standard estimates for cauchy riemann operators that work in Sobolev spaces. And this is what tells you that the linearized operator is Fredholm. Okay, 
Those estimates also do, do exist, for instance, in Helder spaces. So you can not talk about CK, but CK alpha for some positive alpha. Uh, I don't know how to prove the estimates there, but they do exist. You get the Fredholm property, so why don't you use that? Isn't that still somehow simpler than Sobolev spaces? Well, the answer to that is uh, what I'm about to do. Of course, we know what the dual space of LP is in a very concrete way. And that's not true for Holder spaces. I mean, we, the answer is known, but it's not pleasant. Right? The dual of LP is a perfectly pleasant object. I can write it down concretely. So this is the step where it really pays off. And actually, even I, I'm aware of one, one of the mid-90s papers by Hofer, Vysotsky, and Sander where they do use Holder spaces for most of the way. And precisely at this step, they switch to Sobolev spaces. So I've got this element of the dual. Now, the dual is just LQ with exponential weight minus delta for 1 over Q plus 1 over P equals 1. And saying that that annihilates everything in the image means well, I can write that as three separate conditions, in fact, depending on whether I operate with this thing on any of the three variables. So it means, first of all, that if I take any j of tu of y and integrate that against theta, which I can abbreviate as an L2 pairing, so that's the pairing of LP with LQ, uh, that's going to be zero for all y. Same thing will be true for operating with so du eta. That's going to be zero. And whoops, y of tu of j paired with theta will also be zero. So again, this for all eta, this for all y. So that's what comes as saying that theta annihilates the image. Now, uh, the second condition in particular, you can interpret that as saying that theta is a weak solution of another kosher riemann equation, namely for the formal adjoint of du. Right? You can replace du on the right-hand side with its formal adjoint, and if that paired with all eta is zero, that means that the formal adjoint annihilates theta. Now there's various regularity results that tell you anything annihilated by a kosher Riemann operator, even if it's just a weak solution of class LQ, is going to be smooth. And even better, solutions of kosher Riemann equations, if they have zeros anyway, those zeros are isolated, unless the whole thing is trivial. That's the similarity principle. So uh, the second equation really says, formal adjoint du star of theta equals zero. So by regularity, theta is C infinity and has only isolated zeros. I mean, you first need to show that the adjoint is conjugate to some Cauchy Riemann type operator. Yeah, absolutely. So in the background of this is a very general fact that for any Cauchy Riemann type operator, there is a formal adjoint which is conjugate to a Cauchy Riemann type operator. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about this second thing? Well, remember, y is living in an infinite dimensional space, which is large enough to contain bump functions with small support. So I can exploit that fact and say, Let's choose an injective point whose image is contained in the perturbation domain. And now I can choose y to be something that is non-zero only on a neighborhood of that point inside the perturbation domain. But I can make fairly arbitrary choices of that in that small neighborhood. In particular, I can choose y to be supported 
near u of d such that pointwise this pairing is positive, but it vanishes everywhere else. And that's my contradiction. Right? Because if, well, I'm able to do this because I know, in fact, I should have also added this. Without loss of generality, by moving this point, this injective point, a little bit, I can also assume uh, theta of z is not 0. Right? Because there are only isolated zeros of theta. That's what I got from condition 2. Sorry, so is one injective point enough, or do we have kind of data? Well, one injective point implies a neighborhood consisting of injective points. It's, a, it's an open condition. So having that just in a small neighborhood is certainly enough. Yes? Chris, is that, is that because you can always find a y which takes a non-zero vector to another one? Is that, is that what's going on? And yes, it is that you can find y's taking any non-zero vector to any other non-zero vector. It's a slightly non-obvious fact given that I want y to be also tangent to the space of compatible complex structures. So there, again, there's a linear algebra lemma that needs to be proved. There's a proof in our book. That I do know. There is a proof. <laughs> there's, a proof in, there's a proof in my lecture notes as well, which is copied from her book, <laughs> basically. Because uh, it's, one of these, it's one of these proofs that one, one can write it down very short and still get no insight from it. I don't know why it's true, but it's true. Yes, it's a crazy formula. Right? Yes, crazy formula. <laughs> so you don't use condition one? Excellent question. Actually, I was expecting Augustine to ask that question. Um, I didn't use con <laughs> I didn't use condition one in this proof. Okay, which kind of suggests that I didn't use the Teichmüller slice at all. That's where condition one came from. That's, that's the small y, the tangent to the Teichmüller slice. Okay? But this does not mean that the Teichmüller slice isn't somehow important. I was able to achieve transversality here, uh, well, for the universal moduli space without worrying about that. On the other hand, uh, it's still true that there, are, there exist J-holomorphic curves which are stable, which have positive index, so they exist for generic big J but not for generic little j. They will only exist for certain choices of, of little j, and you have to allow that j to be arbitrary in order to find those curves. Right? Because if you fix the conformal structure of the domain, you get a problem that may have negative index, and those things will then not exist. So that's really, it's not so much a transversality question, but it's an index question. My second remark is, uh, I will have occasion to use condition one in some form later in this talk, if I get there. Yeah? Just to check I understand. So you get from this to the uh, J regular, which is called meager in the floor topology. Yeah, OK, I'm not done. Let me, let, me, let me get there. So I proved the universal moduli space is smooth. Why was it so important that we knew the dual in this proof? Well, I could write down the dual as some kind of section of a bundle. It's a very concrete thing instead of an element of the abstract dual space of some other space of sections. Right? And then I used this L2 pairing. Really, I was, it's, the crux of the argument involves this L2 pairing of sections. And that depends on having a precise picture of what, what the dual of that target space is. Because in the end, it wasn't, uh, the argument I made was point-wise. It was not some abstract Hilbert space inner product or something. It was a point-wise argument at the end. All right. This thing is a Bonnach manifold. Now we look at the projection of that to J epsilon, taking a pair of uj to just j. And the sartz mayl theorem tells me
that some generalized sense of almost every j will be regular values. So there exists a co-meager subset, let's call it j epsilon reg in j epsilon, such that for all j in j epsilon reg, uh, and uj belonging to this universal moduli space, so in particular, uh, u has an injective point in the perturbation domain, then u is regular. And in particular, the moduli space with respect to j itself is a smooth manifold. So that's great. A corollary of that is that the set of regular j's in this larger space of smooth, almost complex structures that max, uh, match j fix outside of u is dense. That's immediate because I've achieved regularity for j's in j epsilon, which are arbitrarily c infinity close to j ref. And j ref was arbitrary. That's why I chose j ref instead of j fix. So now this is good. I have density of the, the regular almost complex structures. I think Katrin would tell me I should be satisfied, but I'm not. She's yeah. not here. So. I have a quick question. Yes. So you're using SART to know, well, do you need some sort of fragment condition? Yeah, so SART, SART mail depends on the fact that indeed this map here is, this projection is Fredholm. That's equivalent to the fact that the Cauchy Riemann operator is Fredholm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's an easy exercise. Yeah. Right. So I disagree with Katrin's philosophy in, in a certain sense that, uh, first of all, it's, it's definitely not true that I should always be satisfied to get a non-empty set of regular complex structures. Uh, maybe that's good enough if I only care about defining a theory that I want to prove is an invariant. But if I then also want to compute that theory, I need something more, right? Because usually I can make some specific choice of J for which I am able to count all the holomorphic curves I care about. And uh, of course, that J is not going to be generic. So I need to make a generic perturbation of it. And I need to be assured that I can do such a perturbation of that specific J where I understand everything and attain something regular. So density is at least what I need. I would like a little bit more, in fact, because it's often true that I want to take some space of almost complex structures that I've proven are regular in a certain sense and now intersect it with another space that's regular by a slightly, with, with different conditions, okay? Sometimes I want to do some countable intersection of those. Uh, well, even an intersection of two dense subsets can be empty. So I'd actually like to know that I get co-meager, so countable intersection of open dense subsets. Now, how do I get from here to there? There's a trick for this that was introduced, as far as I know, by Taubes. And it also appears in the book by Dusa and Dietmar, uh, using it for different purposes, because they've got finitely differentiable, almost complex structures. Instead, I'm trying to get now from C epsilon to C infinity. You can apply it in more or less the same way. I think people often don't realize just how widely applicable this is. And I'm going to do a kind of lazy version of it uh, based on the fact that we know the space of holomorphic curves has a nice compactification. Okay? One can be less lazy and, and formulate conditions that are uh, in some sense equivalent to that but uh, requiring less knowledge. I'm just going to say the following. Let's let m good of j denote the space of all curves u in the moduli space which have an injective point in the perturbation domain. And now for each natural number n, define a subset 
of the whole moduli space Mn of j to be the space of all curves with the property that the distance in some metric that I'm not going to specify, but I know where to look up a proof that it exists, distance from u to the complement of the good space in the compactified moduli space. So compactified moduli space minus m good. I want that distance to be greater than or equal to 1 over n. Okay? So in order, I mean, one can make this precise. To do it, one has to look at the appendix of the SFT compactness paper, where they prove that the topology defined on the SFT compactification has a metric. So distance with respect to that metric. So this obviously is a subset of m good. If I take arbitrarily n, large n, I can exhaust m good with this countable union of these subsets. But also this subset is compact. It's a closed subset of a compact metric space. And it's even compact in a slightly stronger sense because this metric on the compactified moduli space uh, depends continuously on j. So I can also move j around. And if, j, if a sequence of j's converges, I can also get convergent subsequences of objects in this sequence of spaces. So the consequence of that, yeah. The, the space and n, so you must come from the space and go. Yes. Yes. It follows from the definition, yeah. Yeah, because the distance is from there is positive. So let's define J reg N to be simply the space of all J's in my admissible class. such that all curves u in m n with respect to j are regular. So that's some set of almost complex structures. It's a subset of the space of smooth almost complex structures. I have the C infinity topology on it. Now, the fact that this subset of the moduli space is compact tells me that this space of regular almost complex structures that only cares about that is open. And it's also dense due to the argument I just did above. I can perturb any almost complex structure to one that achieves regularity for all of M good, not just the subset. So due to the above argument, it's dense. So all I have to do now is say, the space I'm looking for, called J reg U, is the countable intersection of these J reg Ns. And then I'm done, because that's a countable intersection of open dense subsets. So the rant that I will give you on this topic is that uh, the Fleurcy epsilon space is a very nice object, but you shouldn't take it too seriously. My personal opinion is it should never appear in the statement of any theorem. It should appear in lemmas, and it should appear in proofs of theorems. But just about any theorem you can, uh, you can prove about the Fleurcy epsilon space, you can also prove about C infinity using this trick. Okay. And you also get this fact if you have two elements in J. Right, they'll be joined by a regular homotopy. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it's, the argument works in more or less the same way if you want to study regular homotopies. Mm. Can, can you explain this trick? Where, where did you get rid of that epsilon? Yeah, where is epsilon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where is epsilon? Yeah, where is epsilon? Which epsilon? I mean, epsilon is, is a notation representing a space. So 
I guess the key point is, is the claim that this set of J's here is dense. So it follows what I said here is that the set of J's that achieve transversality for me is dense in C infinity as a consequence of the fact that it's also a bare subset of J epsilon. This uses the fact that J epsilon has a continuous inclusion into C infinity. Right, so once I get density in J epsilon, I also get density in C infinity. I mean, the type this trick is, is sort of expressing, finding a compact space so that when it's compact, you can say the regular elements of the compact thing are open. So type this trick gives you the openness. And then, then you take an intersection of open density. Uh, uh, countable intersection. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Excuse me, could you uh, explain again why this JREC N is open? So, yeah, why is this open? So, first of all, this space is compact because it's a closed subset of a compact space. Now, all right, suppose that this thing were not open. What would that mean? It would mean we have, we've got some J that achieves transversality for every curve in this space. But we could also find a sequence of curves, or a sequence of j's converging to our j that don't achieve transversality for every curve in the corresponding spaces here. But now, compactness tells you as the j's converge, the u's in these spaces also have a convergent subsequence. And there are non-regular curves converging to a regular curve. That's what's not possible, because regularity is an open condition. Right? That's surjectivity of a, of a Fredholm operator. That's an open condition. And can you explain dense again? <laughs> okay. Did you believe me up to this point? So I, I, we get, we get co-meager in J epsilon, which implies dense in J epsilon, and that implies dense in C infinity, just because J epsilon includes continuously into C infinity. Well, you have to take over the union for all J fixes. I don't. Because that's that's the part that's not, that's not, no, no, J, yes. J, J refs, yeah, rather, uh, yeah. Over, over all yeah. J refs. Yeah. Right, I mean, what, so, exactly. So what, what this proves is that for your original J ref, you can approximate J ref arbitrarily well in C infinity with, with a regular J. So a J ref was arbitrary. So that, imp that implies that the regular things are dense in C infinity. And dense in that is actually a stronger condition than what we need down here. It implies it immediately. Yeah. Uh, so if I have a sequence in M and J, I could converge to something nowhere, right? No. A sequence in M and J will not converge to anything nodal because it is a positive distance away from the nodal part of the compactified modulus space. It's, but what if, I mean, there can be nodal things in M good, right? No, there cannot be. Right. M good consists only of somewhere injective, honest J holomorphic curves. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it really seems like cheating, right? You're, you're using the knowledge that this compactification exists and <coughs> just saying, let's stay a finite distance, a positive distance away from the bad part of the compactification. But for M of J, you kind of fix some possibilities. Uh, I don't have to, well, I, I assume non-degenerate ray orbits, but I don't have to fix more than that. Well, to get, I mean, finite, uniform finite, Um This is okay. Well, no, okay. What I, actually, here's a good reason why I want co-meager. What I really should do is do this whole argument just looking at holomorphic curves in a fixed genus and fixed relative homology class and then say, having proven we have a co-meager subset for that genus and that homology class, now take the countable intersection of all those choices as well. If you're um, just looking at maps whose domain is a sphere, so it would make it really simple, yeah. then, then this M and J, you can define it simply by giving a, a, a pointwise bound to the derivative. Just so right. the derivative is bounded by some constant number. That's a good point. And, and then that means yeah. that no bubbles can form. I mean, it's, it's equivalent to this. It's just right. a much easier formulation. This is what you actually see when people use this in the literature. I mean, I'm using this formulation as, uh, as a shortcut. 
But when you write this down in the literature, usually people write down a list of conditions that say things like the, the C1 norm of D, or the, the sup norm of DU is, is bounded by 1 over n, or sorry, bounded by n. Also, some condition about distance of u of x minus u of y divided by a distance from x to y should be uh, within bounds determined by m so that you stay away from the multiply covered curves. And you need something to keep, your, uh, keep you with positive distance away from nodal curves as well. So one can also, one can write down conditions like that which do everything for you without having to first prove Gromov compactness or SFT compactness, whichever, right? So the argument, in fact, it, you can do this in for closed curves, at least, you can do this in almost complex manifolds that are not tamed by a symplectic structure. You don't have to prove Gromov compactness first. You just have these conditions. You have elliptic regularity telling you C1 bounds will give you compactness, and so forth. OK. Can I ask one last time, why yeah. does injective uh, inclusion imply density mm -hmm. for C infinity? Mm -hmm. So this, the claim is this. If I have a sequence of Js, converging to some particular j in the C epsilon topology, then it also converges in the C infinity topology. Okay. So, so as soon as you know that you can approximate whatever j you want arbitrarily well in j epsilon, you have that that's also true in C infinity. And Chris, the, the, the bit of the proof that, that fails when you have, say, multiple covers is, is that hidden in, in the board hidden there, right? When you say that that thing is positive. And because you, you can have yes. that if you, if you go around the point twice, say. Right. Yeah, let's look at that again. So why does this fail for a multiple cover? I said choose an injective point and we make this perturbation of, so we define y in some fashion on a neighborhood of u of z. Now, I want to do that such that this pointwise pairing becomes positive in a neighborhood of z. And I want to also know that it's not going to be positive in any other neighborhood somewhere else, which would happen if you had another point going through u of z. That's why this fails for multiple covers. Well, it could be negative. More important to the point, it could be negative somewhere Indeed. else, and then it would cancel out. Indeed. I, I can't conclude anything unless I really know that, that this is the only place where u is going through this region. How much time do I actually have? Uh, Five-ish minutes. Yeah, so I would, I would argue that uh, this has been a sort of hybrid lecture and discussion session, and that the afternoon discussion session should be the same thing. So you, you haven't so, used one still, right? I've yeah, not, I've not the, used condition one, uh, no. The organizers we approve. approve. Very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, or maybe we shouldn't let everyone else know before. <laughs> so let me at least um, write down the statement of what I still need to get to in the afternoon. So hopefully we're happy now with transversality for simple curves in symplectic cobordisms. Actually, can you no. maybe move the tapestry board down so that you can split your ass? Okay. So, in order to actually do SFT, we also need to understand transversality for curves and symplectizations. So, that's the translation invariant J. Here's the theorem. So let's, let's say now M is just going to be a closed odd dimensional manifold. We've got a stable Hamiltonian structure. With the, it induces our, our hyperplane distribution psi and rate vector field RH. And remember, we have from that a special class of translation invariant almost complex structures associated to the Hamiltonian, uh, stable Hamiltonian structure. So theorem three says that there exists another space I'm going to call J reg. It's a co-meager subset 
of jh such that for all j's and j reg, all j holomorphic curves with, how should I say this, uh, that are somewhere injective and not everywhere tangent to xi are regular. So let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, we're working in R cross M. Okay, so it's a trivial symplectic cobordism, which means our map can be written in terms of a real valued function and a map from a function of Riemann surface into M. I call those UR and UM. And there's really two points of difficulty about this theorem. First, the perturbations I'm making for J are no longer really local because I require J always to be translation invariant. So any perturbation I make near a particular point is going to affect what J is everywhere up and down from there. So that problem turns out to be relatively easy to solve. There's a technical lemma which appears in one of the mid-90s HWZ papers again that says if U is somewhere injective, then the oops, injective points of the map UM from the puncture Riemann surface to the odd dimensional manifold are also dense. Okay, I'm not going to prove this. Actually, I've not yet managed to understand the proof because I haven't sat down with it long enough, but I can tell you where to look it up if you want to look it up. Uh, can you, can you no. just finite energy or something? Yeah, I always assume finite energy. I, I'm, if you want to hear about infinite energy curves and symplectizations, you have to speak with Joel Fish and not with me. So, uh, so that's one thing. So I, I'm, I'm not going to be too worried about the translation invariance as long as I know that the map to M itself has an injective point. Then I can imagine I could do the same trick I did with a perturbation <laughs> just supported near that point and uh, that's not going to mess anything up. But what I'm more worried about is the fact that, remember, what are the conditions that these j's must satisfy? Well, for one thing, j maps the unit vector in the r direction to the rate vector field. And the rate vector field is not ever changing in this picture. That's fixed by the stable Hamiltonian structure I started with. The only thing I'm allowed to vary is how j maps the hyperplane distribution to itself. So I'm doing perturbations of j on a sub-bundle of real co-dimension 2. And I need to know that those perturbations are going to be a large enough space to achieve transversality. And you might notice from the statement of my theorem that uh, if you're not careful, this isn't true. There are, in fact, for certain stable Hamiltonian structures, uh, J holomorphic curves that will not be made regular by any perturbation of this sort. Just quickly write down an example and then it's lunchtime. Let's say uh, M is S1 times W where again W omega is a closed symplectic manifold. No, let's, let's make it simpler than this. Let's just say sigma is a surface. So S1 times W and 
say t is the coordinate on S1. Uh, omega is an area form on sigma. And then this is the, the Fleur homology example that I gave you yesterday, but just with the two-dimensional case. So to do Fleur homology in a two-dimensional manifold, you would write down this stable Hamiltonian structure of the form big omega equals omega plus some Hamiltonian term, if you like, or just take the Hamiltonian to be 0 for now, uh, lambda equals dt. So it means that psi here is the foliation by these surfaces sigma. And if I'm perturbing j in this translation invariant class, I'm really only perturbing what j does on that foliation. So that means I'm looking at t-dependent families of complex structures on sigma. Well, for all such choices, there exist closed J-holomorphic curves that look like map sigma to r times s1 times sigma by taking z to uh, constant, constant z. And these will sometimes have negative index. So there's an exercise for lunchtime. Convince yourself that uh, if you were really allowed to take a fully generic perturbation of J, you would kill all these curves if the, in, if the genus is large, because they have negative index. So it means the perturbations in this translation are invariant class are not large enough to actually achieve transversality for everything. They don't for these curves. So that's why I have this extra condition. You have to just pay attention to curves that are not everywhere tangent to xi. Now, for the case that most of us care about most, xi is a context structure. And it's easy to guarantee that your curve will never be everywhere tangent to xi. Okay. So I will uh, I'll continue with this in the afternoon. So in particular, any, any uh, cylindrical thing? Any cylindrical thing. Any well, these. This, cur this curve is asymptotically cylindrical. All of its punctures approach ray orbits. All, all zero of them. Actually, you only need, I mean, genus one is, if it's a torus, it's good enough. Because yeah. you've only got one variation, and you're not only allowed to vary in the S1 direction, not in the R direction. Yeah, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna commit myself to a statement like this, but I think it's true. Gen genus one is already a contradiction already, to transversality. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, so why don't we thank Chris? <laughs>